Beautiful. So our next session is titled Triage, a real world error logging for web applications. Uh, our presenters this morning are developers for 99designs. Uh, that's a Melbourne based startup where they're working on infrastructure and data needs. Uh, today they're going to be talking about Triage, which is a real world tool for error logging for web applications. So please give a welcome to Luke Kaywood and Lars Jenkin. Thank you. All right, is this my? Yeah, perfect. Um, so I'm Lars. This is Luke. Hello. Both of us, <laughs> both of us work for 99 Designs, and um, yeah, today we're going to be talking about this. We're really going to be talking about errors and how we've historically kind of been dealing with errors that we get in production, and how we're trying to deal with them in a much better way with um, some work that Luke and some of the guys have done on triage. Um, and I'll be sort of introducing things. At 99 Designs, I'm uh, in DevOps, and so and Luke's a senior dev. It means we kind of get a different perspective on errors. Uh, Luke's gonna like Luke could be checking them as he pushes out code and deploys things to make sure things are going all right. And uh, <laughs> when I get an alert in the middle of the night, I'll be sort of bleary-eyed checking out the logs, trying to work out what's happening. So, in terms of 99 Designs, I'm probably I'm probably not going to tell you too much about a company. I mean, it's enough really for you to know that we're a web company and we get a fair amount of traffic. Our audience is pretty global, so in any time zone, when we go down, when we have issues, we really do lose money. And um, yeah, we, it's really important for us to have a good user experience at all times. I'm going to pretend that there's not a little squiggly <laughs> sign, a question mark there. So this. Really, again, was just a screenshot of our site, just to say, you know, we're we're a website. This is what we do. Um, so we have quite a lot of requests coming in all the time, and so we've given talks before on our infrastructure. In fact, we've got a blog post on our tech blog. You can check it out. All I really want for you to, from you to get from this slide is that, you know. We have a fairly typical web stack. This is a simplified version. It's got lots of parts, though. Any of the parts can fail. Any of the interactions between the parts can fail. And um, anything really from this sort of application layer below, um, those are the things that feed into our error logging system. So we're mainly a, mainly a PHP shop, and our main code base runs on, the, runs on these application servers. We've got, say, maybe a bit more than 20 running now. And the same code base runs on the workers as well. So you know, when you go to our website, uh, the part that you're waiting for is the re web request that the application servers are uh, serving. And the part that you're, any extra work stuff you're not waiting for, that's going to a queue. And the workers are churning away at that. And when, whenever there's an error in either of those two parts, the first thing we do is throw it straight into a database. Uh, we put it into Mongo, and the the really uh, nice thing, the bit that that solves already, is that the we across the machines, I guess, the aggregation. Right? That's right. So uh, instead of having to like trawl across all these machines, we've got a single error feed, and that helps us a lot. Um, you guys are going to have to put up with a couple of grey boxes of death for some unknown reason. Yeah, but it's essentially, for for errors, we use like we expose that to our devs as a standard RSS feed. We use like desktop RSS client. It's really easy to get this sort of list of errors. Um, but there's a couple of problems with the types of there's a couple of problems that we've had using this RSS model for errors. So, uh, for example, when we get an error in. We, well, one thing there's a there's constant stream of like constant stream of uh, errors coming in because we have enough traffic volume that even rare errors are coming in. But when we, when we see an error, we don't know is that just from the last deploy? Has that been there for a while? Only by looking at the logs regularly and remembering, it's sort of it's a lot of manual work. Yeah, we well, don't have a, I guess a yeah, great uh, feeling of the the, his, the historical data because the RSS feed only goes back I think t two weeks or something. So you don't know if an error has been around for forever. Exactly. And, yeah. So, sorry. So there's a new and if there's a new error in the logs, we're like, all right. So that's probably this dev's work. 
is he working on it? You have to actually go and ask someone, you know, to work out whether or not an error is actually being handled by someone right now. Um, there's also this issue that if we have, uh, like often we get an issue and a particular type of error floods the logs. And when that happens, you can't see anything else. Uh, sometimes that's kind of important. So if it's like we get an error that's flooding the logs saying column not found in our database, well, you know, that's good. We, we kind of like to know about that, then that it's kind of important. That but was meant to be on this page. <laughs> <laughs> but if we get, um, on the other hand, we can get a really low grade error that for some reason this high volume floods the logs and we can't see anything important with so much of this low grade error coming through. So with this RSS situation, it's like the volume of the error is the same as the priority of the error. Sorry, Lars. We're playing the wrong slideshow. I lying. forgive you. <laughs> Pictures. <laughs> Technology. All right. Sorry. From our site. Yeah. Let's yeah. skip through. Oh, yeah. Standard Mac RSS client to get our error feed, stack trace, context, stuff like that. What an error flood, flooding the log. Yeah. Um, but really, so that's the background on this kind of, on how we've historically dealt with errors. And I think uh, from there, I'll let Luke tell you about how we've tried to improve that with uh, uh, a new error logging app triage. Yeah, thanks, Lars. Um, so I suppose, yeah, yeah, as Lars said, I mean, this is not ideal. And um, so we, there are obviously uh, sort like products in this space. Uh, but we thought we'd, we'd um, play with some new tools, get a chance to play with some new tech and build something on our own. Uh, also, I guess we do have a really, really high error rate and that we were kind of concerned uh, if, if anything off the shelf would be able to handle that. Um, so, yeah, we, uh, it's, we, we decided to build an error logging platform, uh, sort of similar to Airbrake or something if you've used that. It's designed to be language agnostic. Uh, we need to build, obviously, all the clients, client uh, for, for all the languages. but. Um, yeah, so essentially our first, our first shot was to sort of try and deliver it in a day during, uh, we have uh, R&D time at, at 99 Designs, and we thought we'd try and build, build something in a day and deliver some, some prototype. So we figured we'd use the existing MongoDB infrastructure that was in place for the RSS feed and just build like a web app on top of that to present that. Uh, we opted to use Pyramid because it's really fast, it's unopinionated, it wasn't going to lock us into an ORM or anything like that. Uh, and I just like the design. Um, so we deployed that alongside the RSS solution so we could get a measure of our success and whether or not it was doing the right sort of thing. Um, so yeah, we, we continued logging to Mongo, but then we sort of had this issue of like, well, how are we going to aggregate? Because we wanted to sort of aggregate like errors to collapse that sort of massive feed of garbage into a single data point. Uh, and so we attempted to, to, uh, to to use Mongo's MapReduce in request, since we were logging directly to the DB, we had no other hook point that we could we could attempt to, to MapReduce. So we did it in a day, and uh, so it, it, I mean, this is what it looks like. This was the result of a day, thanks to uh, some Twitter bootstrap love, because it's just uh, really quick and easy to get going. And you can see there that it's it's aggregating on the left hand side, and it's got some measure of tagging and, and claiming and stuff. Um, and that was in Feb, uh, but. Unfortunately, as soon as we tried to hit that with our production load, just collapsed straight away. Uh, it turns out you cannot do MapReduce in request. Uh, who would have thought? <laughs> um, it was taking, taking half an hour for requests to come back and when it was aggregating at view time as opposed to at write time. So yeah, half an hour is probably a little bit too long to wait for a, a web page. Um, yeah, so our error rate's obviously pretty extreme. Um, so we thought, all right, so we're gonna have to, to to aggregate at, uh, at right time, so we can't write directly to Mongo, we're going to need to put something out front. And so we, once again, as a chance to play with some new tools, we used uh, ZeroMQ. Uh, if you haven't heard of that, it's like a, a queue system that sort of masquerades as a socket system, or we are one however way around that makes sense. It, uh, it pre presents a socket API, or a socket-like API, but actually is like a queue layer underneath. Uh, so. And we use message pack, uh, which is a sweet little binary format for, for the on-the-wire format sort of thing. So sort of like similar to JSON in terms of feature set, but it's binary and really, really quick. So you can see here, you can see here, you can see here, um, sort of like a really cut down lightweight version of connecting 0MQ 
as, a, as a host, but actually as a subscriber to a pub sub socket uh, and, and connecting that to message pack. And I mean, the server's like four lines long. It's just so trivial to get going, um, which is pretty cool. So I would definitely recommend playing with 0MQ if you get a chance. Uh, aggregation's happening in Python space now. So it's not, it's, um, did I get heaps louder? It did. <laughs> Aggregation's now happening in Python space, which, uh, which yeah, at, at right time, which is pretty cool. Like we can, we can generate a hash and then sort of, it's a bit of a naive approach. So we query for the existence of a row. If the row is there, we update it. If it's not, we insert one. Um, and we gave the interface some love as well but during these, this time. We've fast forwarded. Oh, this is still fab. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, so it's a bit of a thicker client now. It's sort of really JS heavy. Uh, we opted for a bit of a, you can see like a, um, the errors come in in this bottom pane sort of thing. So it's like a single app, single page app model. Uh, yeah, I guess similar to some IDE sort of thing. Trying to make it better for devs to use. So it's got like Vim key bindings and stuff and a bit, a bit more sex appeal. Um, and that was great. That was working for ages until I got this email from Lars uh, at quarter to six in the morning, because Lars doesn't like sleeping. Uh, yeah, I'm sure that was by choice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> DevOps. Um, so yeah, we, yeah, the error rate kind of spiked a bit. We were in two days, we logged 3.5 terabits of error data, which was like, yeah, kind of insane. So it turns out we'd, we'd made a change to our uh, worker stack and it, um, when tasks fail in the, in the queues, they should, they should eventually get buried, but they weren't getting buried. So we were just completely getting thrashed, like thousands and thousands of messages every sort of like five minutes sort of thing. So um, yeah, obviously we fixed the queues, but also did uh, shine some light on sort of triage. It, as uh, as it, it couldn't process errors in real time at that point, there was just so many, it started to look like drop behind reality. And um, because of the queue nature, I guess the zero MQ, it's, it's backing up, backing up sort of thing until eventually it's just dropping data. So kind of, I guess, yeah, weakened the confidence that the team had in using triage as well because it's all of a sudden it's not accurate. And so like, yeah, we had to, had to optimize it. Um, so it turned out it was taking three seconds to log an error and the, the logging server was capped at 100% CPU, um, which was obviously not ideal. Um, we kind of, Lars and I split them into sort of like Lars was looking at some multi-threaded, trying to get some more some uh, more throughput via just forking everything and just going nuts. Um, and I looked at optimizing Mongo. We were, so it made some gains, I guess, in both. Like uh, I suppose, yeah, with Mongo, there's no schema, but it actually turns out that obviously the document structure has a massive performance impact. So they kind of yeah, you can do anything you like, but you can get yourself in a lot of trouble, um, which is great. But the biggest win came from uh, moving the update or insert, sort of select update insert code directly into Mongo via Mongo upserts. So if you don't know what Mongo upserts are, essentially it's like, a, it's like an update. Um, so the updates in Mongo, you have a criteria document, which is what you're going to try and, the record you're going to try and find to update. You've got your update document, which is what you're going to add, change, or remove. Uh, and then you've got the, the ability to specify that it's a, a, an upsert. So an upsert, if it doesn't match a row, will actually insert that row for you. So it'll take the criteria document and the update document and sort of like make a, a, a target document out of that and insert that. Um, so it's a bit of a worked example. Say, so, can everyone read that? Um, say we're tracking clicks and so we want to track clicks. So you want, to, want a URL that you're going to, you're going to track. You're going to have like a measure of how many times it's been clicked, say, and some sort of item, some piece of data on, on each click. So say just the timestamp here. Um, you can see that the update, cr the criteria document is the URL. Someone's clicking on google.com, all right. Um, that probably happens all the time. Uh, and this, this is a sort of weird format on the second row of the, uh, the update function. These, these like dollar set things are what they call update modifiers. So they can act on an existing row. You've got incrementers, the ability to push into internal arrays and all that sort of stuff. So really, really powerful. And then obviously the fact that we're, we're upsetting. So you run that and you're going to insert a row. There's not going to be, you can see we've queried the data set. There's nothing there. So we're inserting, essentially that's going to be an insert. Um, count sort of sanely defaults to one. So if you increment from nothing to one, it's one which is yeah, sane and good. Uh, and we've pushed a click. And so, so we run the exact same code again, no change. 
we actually update that, that row because the criteria document matches the document that was inserted and up update. So yeah, that's really, really cool. And, and doing that actually got our CPU utilization down to 3% from 100 uh, and processing errors in real time. So like, Mongo is web scale if you use it. <laughs> um, uh, and then so, so it, uh, we still had a bit of traction issues in the office getting people to use triage. Uh, and it turns out that because we're replacing an RSS solution, people have client side, a client side app. So they've got desktop notifications and dock icons that bounce and you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, and delivering that in the web app's quite hard, but luckily we found uh, something called Fluid App, which is a, a Mac application that can take a web app and sort of turn it into a, an application with its own dock icon. It's actually got this really awesome JavaScript API, so this is how Triage is looking now, um, such that, that that sort of notification that says there's been three errors, we can actually push that as a ground notification on the desktop if the, if the apps are running inside Fluid. Really easy to, t to detect the existence of the Fluid API and, uh, and sort of progressively enhance the experience. So yeah, that's really cool. I'd recommend playing with that too. Um, so, so we're using it now and it's like, it's doing its job. And that's all good. But I suppose, it's, yeah, we've actually sort of, it's, it's aggregating. And I guess we're learning things now that we're using it. Um, one thing is that getting the right level of grouping for errors is really, really, really tricky. It's, um, it's sort of either you, you hide too much stuff and people don't have the information they need to, to, to actually solve the error, or you end up presenting too much stuff. And getting that balance is really, really hard. We've got, I suppose, because we had no historical data, now we have all the historical data in the world. Some of the error counts are in like the 20, 30 thousands, and it's just kind of lost all meaning because the numbers are just so big. Um, and, and no one's fixing the bugs. <laughs> um, so currently, that stuff's a bit of an open problem. We, we, uh, yeah, when I next get a chance, I want to look at tweaking the aggregation. Um, and I'd, yeah, I'd love some assistance with that if anyone uh, you know, wants to pitch in. Um, for the future, I would love to get it in PyPy as well. Um, at the moment, getting it set up for dev is a bit of a pain in the ass, and it's kind of it's multiple dependencies all over the place. It'd be sweet to package it up. And because um, we're a PHP shop, embarrassingly, the only client that exists at the moment is a PHP client. So it's written in Python, uh, but it can only log errors from PHP. So it, uh, it probably needs a, PHP, a Python logger at the very least. Uh, and someone had the idea of his uh, drop, uh, Airbrake is probably the biggest commercial product in this space. So someone had the idea of writing a client that's a drop-in replacement. So we can essentially just you can just go from logging to Airbrake and just switch straight over to logging to us, which would be awesome. Not that no, we're not going to run it as a service, but um, people can install it and just make the transition really easy. And then client-side logging would be handy. And then ultimately down the track, I'd love to do sort of like Gmail rule filtering style, so you can just arbitrarily create errors, uh, create um, rules and apply actions to those rules on, on an incoming error feed, which would be like killer, killer feature. Um, sweet. Thank you very much. <laughs> Last one. Uh, thanks very much, guys. Uh, have we got any questions? Uh, I see Russell's next door. <laughs> Are you going? Uh, so with the aggregation at the moment, it's uh, is it it seems like it's uh, fairly basic, pretty much on straight counts for error occurrence. Yep. Uh, do you have plans to expand that out so you can start to see errors over time and so forth, and to take the aggregation to that level? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we do still have a lot of the the per instance information, um, and Lars has actually been looking at graphing that. So it's part of that sort of error uh, error like sort of detail view, there'll be some graphs like frequency graphs over time and all that sort of stuff. We have some basic GitHub integration at the moment such that when we, put, when we push deployments, our app is aware of the current version of, um, of, of the code base in terms of Git, uh, uh, Git commit. Uh, so we push that in, into triage and we actually know first and last commit range for an error. So we know the first time in terms of commits that we ever saw an error and the most recent time that we've ever seen it. So you can sort of see, all right, well, that commit fixed it, actually, or that commit introduced it. And then you can diff between that and the last, the last uh, head, essentially, and say, well, that commit, like this commit range introduced it and this commit range fixed it sort of thing. So it's pretty cool. Uh, 
anybody else? Uh, I have a question, actually. Sure. Um, so uh, you're talking about the uh, different clients, like like having, and you've only got a PHP client. Yep. Um, I know that, uh, like Stats D, for example, which is slightly different, but it basically I think just does like a UDP connection, U UDP connection, like so you just just squirt some data shove off. it out and and it just takes care of it. Have you thought about doing something like that? Because uh, sometimes. You know, you're like if if your login goes down and then you you're using a client that tries to push to it and it can't get to it, then you know. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So well, the the pub sub nature of zero MQ, it, if the server's not there, it's actually fine. It'll yeah, just silently fail. So yeah, log to nothing. Yeah. Cool. And and so the the thought about having it like a already kind of standard thing, so any client could just push out the right UDP to. CRMQ or whatever? Uh, yeah, so I suppose, yeah, um, as part of the, the Airbrake API sort of uh, implementation, I'm sure we'll have a fairly generic implementation that should be yeah, fairly easy to, to, to drop in. Um, I suppose, yeah, the advantage, well, the, the reason, the rationale behind ZeroMQ was that it's just so quick and asynchronous. Um, and I'm pretty sure Airbrake is actually just a REST style interface, so we'll probably have to spin up something like Twisted or Tornado to sort of deal with that level of concurrency of, of errors, at least for us, because like, it's like a thousand errors a second sometimes. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just DOS our own server straight away. I think, I think you've probably made us all feel really good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, thanks for that. I just slightly missed the, uh, the feature that you moved to MongoDB that dramatically reduced your CPU usage. Uh, right. That so we, we were doing sort of the, um, the, the select, like the update or insert, like select and update or insert sort of pattern in in uh, in Python so we're doing a Mongo select and Mongo is really 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 quick to write to but it's n a less quick to read from sort of thing so yeah, it's like it's got great write time performance so if you can write to Mongo without querying at first you'll be you'll make a massive massive gain oh another one Could you port the um, client side of zero MQ to other languages? Uh, absolutely. So zero, there's uh, zero MQ bindings for almost all languages, and it's actually really trivial to implement the error logger. It's just you just need to serialize the exception and chuck it on zero MQ. It's quite quite easy. Yeah, I've actually got a, a rough uh, Python one that I started hacking on last night because I felt guilty about not having a Python client. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, so it's, it probably weighs in at like under 30 or 40 lines, so it's quite trivial. Oh, uh, anybody else? <laughs> uh, just in terms of the feature set, yep. uh, do you have plans in the, uh, the pipeline for an API so that you can push that information out to things like your Atlassian bug tracking uh, so absolutely. Developer suites. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the I, I guess, especially if when we get to the uh, sort of the Gmail rule builder, I think it would be great to be able to sort of define like rules and actions that sort of end up as tickets. Like if this error occurs 15 times in a time range, or if it's got some tag, or if it's got some if it's some some particular class of error that I'm going to be looking for, create a GitHub issue or an Atlassian issue or something like that. Yeah, that would be really really awesome. Or yeah. Um, new Relic integration, there's just heaps you could do with it, sort of thing. Yeah, just, just to add quickly, um, so as well as the code errors, you also get like transient infrastructural issues that will cause like a flurry of errors and maybe we fix it. Um, so in, in some ways, yeah, this sort of uh, rules would be really useful to work out almost uh, which queue it goes in. Like, oh, this is a, this is clearly a DevOps issue. Like, there's an issue, this type of issue work in the DevOps pipeline or alert DevOps, this kind of issue that's uh, related to this commit, as we were saying. Um, flag that developer. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the other, on that, yeah, in that sense, uh, the other sort of thing that we want to do is, so, so we have this GitHub uh, well, that with this uh, Git awareness sort of thing, and we can, it's actually an API so that you can push deployment information to triage, and off that I'd like to hang some sort of like auto-resolve type feature, so that say, when you when you release when you yeah, when you release code, say maybe all the active bugs sort of get put to the side, and if they occur again, they get brought into the main sort of error feed. So it sort of can be self-regulating a bit rather than have this massive list. All 
All right, uh, unless we have any more questions. Um, uh, we seem to, oh, already good, cool. Uh, thank you very much, guys. Uh, maybe Thanks. just mug Graham for his second one. I'm not sure where the second mug. Yeah, Graham has too many anyway. <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. And uh, I think that's it and we're at lunch now.